great to see you. Great to chat with you. Um, are are you through and sort of over the regular season and just fully focused on playoffs? Or has it just been, as we talked to TA earlier on the show, this never ending season that at this point you don't even know what day it is? Um, basically a mix out of both. Um, hey, Adam, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm actually a little bit exhausted, a little bit burned out after the regular season. Uh, it was a really weird season, tough season, like uh, a 24 7 news grind. Then we had all the COVID stuff at the end of the season for the past couple of weeks. It was really a really tough grind this season. And um, I'm happy. I'm actually happy that we don't have 15 games on the board this week. <laughs> I'm right there with you. But where it gets tough for you is so you're in Germany. So you're six hours ahead of Eastern time, eight hours ahead of where I am. I find it difficult with the cycles mid-afternoon, late in the evening. What does that daily schedule look like for you in a season as confusing as this past one was? Um, basically, um, you're up in the morning, you're working on some NFL stuff, and then I would say uh, around 4 p.m. my time in the afternoon, um, all the, let's say, new cycle of the NFL starts. Like, um, let's say, Wednesday to Friday, uh, usually at 4 p.m. my time, the early practices start on, on the East Coast. Then it goes until like 9, 10 uh, in the evening. And that's basically the um, high time where you have to be focused and check every Twitter notification, every practice report, who's practicing, who is not, um, who could be iffy for Sunday to get a ahead of some line moves. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, during the week, it's not as big of a toll, but then when you add like uh, watching primetime games in the night, 2.30 a.m. in the morning um, and twice, sometimes twice per week on um, Thursday and Sunday, that's going to add up over the course of the season. And then um, right now, I'm really looking forward to getting more sleep in the offseason. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like struggling through a Trevor Lawrence Jags game at 3.30 a.m. on a Friday morning to get your week started for football. Um, exactly. Curious to know, when it comes to betting the regular season, you're a guy that you put in a bet. There's people waiting for notifications on that account. They're following. Lines are moving. Anytime you're betting, the market's moving behind you. When it comes to the regular season, I would say that even from just my perspective watching the screen, I know when you're betting, I know when it's something from you certain times of the week, and I know based on how much things are moving. In the playoffs, do you notice any differences in how the market reacts to your bets with these obviously being bigger handle games? Yeah, especially later in the week, there's not as much of a movement um, as in the regular season. So, for example, um, Tuesday to Thursday, there's some pretty hefty uh, movement after some releases and then usually on Friday, Saturday, it, it cools down when you have college football on Saturday and all the accounts are tied up, then sometimes you do a release and it only moves a couple of cents. Um, and now with the playoffs, we usually have uh, some more earlier, bigger limits. Um, and then you, you could usually maybe see on Thursday or Friday that the market has made sure it is becoming more efficient, more money to the market. And then it's, it, maybe it cools down a little bit earlier, I would say. Are you doing anything different in terms of your rating specifically between regular season and playoffs, home field advantage, anything like that? Does it change for you at all? A little bit, not too much. Um, I would say that I make a few subjective adjustments in the, in the playoffs, like um, first year quarterback, first year rookie head coach, um, sometimes um, that's also a little bit scientific. I mean, we have a, a history of rookie quarterbacks or quarterbacks in their first playoff start um, struggling, um, lots of pressure, especially when you play in a world environment. Um, rookie uh, head coaches could some sometimes be overwhelmed when they face a veteran head coach on the other side. So um, there's not a lot of data, as it's always the case with the NFL, but I try to make a few subjective adjustments. For example, this week, Bucks against Eagles. Um, I would say Tom Brady and Bruce Arians um, on the one side. And on the other side, you have Jalen Hurts and his first ever playoff start. Tough road game, also a probably tough tough weather game with Nick Sirianni coaching his first playoff game. So I think there are increased chances um, that 
those guys are a little bit under pressure and might make a few more mental mistakes and it would be the case for a casual week 13 regular season game so these are basically the kinds of adjustments then we also have home field advantage as you've mentioned um playoff home field advantage is usually stronger even if you um, adjust for um, the strength of, of the team so usually um, if you get the first seed uh, or the second seed in prior seasons you are usually among the best teams in the league so it's just uh, common sense that you also have a better advantage when playing on, on two or two weeks rest but we see in the playoffs that, that even when we adjust for um, team strength there's still a bigger home field advantage than usual and that's something you have to price in to your numbers let me ask you about one team before I, I'm curious to ask a little bit more about Tampa Bay, but then also another game that you've bet. I'm having a very tough time trying to price Tennessee. And a lot of that is because of the, basically we've seen two teams in one over the course of the season. And I don't know which team is closer to reality. When you're looking at the Titans, they're on a buy this week, but Right at Sunday night, we're going to get a price for them against an AFC opponent. When it comes to sort of thinking about the Titans, where do you stand on them? Um, I probably have them in the middle tier in the AFC. I have them a step down below KC and Buffalo, for example, but I also have them ranked higher than, for instance, uh, Cincinnati um, Raiders, of course. Um, I, and I also think I have them a tiny little bit higher than uh, ten, uh, uh, sorry, than the Patriots. Um, I mean, we are getting Ryan Tannehill, who is a decent quarterback in his three years in um, in Tennessee. Um, also, this year he is one of the best uh, quarterbacks. When you look at some of the stuff like EPA and uh, com, um, completion percentage above expectations, he's a fringe top ten quarterback despite all the circumstances. Now he's having AJ Brown back, Julio Jones back, should be close to 100 percent. That offensive line is finally healthy. Um, so that one game for that offensive line is also superb. Um, depends on the matchup, uh, who they are going to draw next week. And their defense also better th than in years past. They have a decent secondary. Their front four can generate some pressure and is um, playing very well against the run over the second half of the season. So I think we should not sleep on the Titans, um, even though the way they got into the first seed is probably, um, let's say, fortunate. Lots back of then. close games, yeah. Close games um, against all the top contenders and lots of stinkers against the bad teams. Um, so it was a completely wild season for them. But if you put everything together, that offense is finally healthy. Um, I think they they finished the season like 20th in offensive DVOA. And I would assume that even though it's not a top tier offense, we should probably rate them somewhere between the top tier and the place 20 they are currently ranked. In, in stats like DBOA, um, fully healthy team, solid defense, coming off two two weeks west, home field advantage. I just think we should not sleep on the Titans, even though they sneaked into the first seed. That's my opinion. I can't wait to see what the opener is Sunday night on them against whoever they play. It's going to be, I think, the more interesting game, potentially value-wise, for the AFC. Yeah. Uh, speaking of value in the AFC, I believe you have already bet an AFC team on Saturday. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I went on the Raiders at plus six. I think the consensus market price is um, currently around five, five and a half. Um, I would probably like the Raiders down to plus six minus 120. I made the number around four and a half. So I was um, uh, pretty happy to grab the six there. I, I would not, I would not go below the six. Um, and the reasoning is that I think there is not that six point difference between both teams. So when you when you stack up both teams against one another over the course of the season, the Bengals are a very, I would say, low floor, high ceiling team. They are basically living off um, Joe Burrow, making crazy things happen with his wide receivers. And when that passing game is really on and, and flying high octane, they could basically match up with everyone in the AFC, no doubt about it. But that's not our mean expectations going through the first round of the playoffs. Um, I also think that it's pretty interesting that Joe Burrow, over the course of the season, I, I looked up the numbers um, earlier today, he's averaging 0.38 EPA per pass against blitzes. That's basically better than Aaron Rodgers' MVP season. And when he's not getting blitz, he's averaging just 0.002 EPA per play. So basically a 
let's say, a league average quarterback in terms of efficiency when he's not getting blitz and when he's facing four and three man rushes. 12 of his 40 interceptions came against uh, non blitzes. And the Raiders, they have the perfect opponent for that because they have, I think, they have the lowest blitz rate in the entire league. They try to generate pressure with their front four. Uh, Max Crosby is going to be lined up against backup tackle Isaiah Prince. So, what the Bengals basically kind of struggle in um, going empty and um, struggling to, to protect the edges, I think that's a matchup that plays into the advantage of the um, Las Vegas Raiders. So, I, I'm just not expecting Joe Brew to, to light up the defense like he did against the Ravens uh, three weeks ago, against the Chiefs two weeks ago. I think it's a completely different matchup with a stout front four that can generate pressure and might force uh, one or two mistakes out of Joe Burrow. Um, that won't prevent them from scoring points because the Raiders also have matchup disadvantages uh, on their secondary against Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. Um, but on the other side, the Bengals don't have a really good defense. Um, they are ex especially vulnerable over the middle. They struggle to cover tight ends and that's basically the bread and butter of the of the Las Vegas Raiders. Hunter Renfro, Darren Waller over the middle. I, I would expect like a heavy dose of um, targeting both both those guys. And then I think in the end, this is a matchup where the Las Vegas Raiders can hang on, can go wire to wire. And in that case, um, I really like having six in my back pocket. I think there. So there's two comments I have. The first thing is just connecting the dots for people to watch yesterday and then have watched today. We had John Sheeran on from FanDuel, their team, not afraid to set a number and go against the market. He made this game and with his team four and a half. We had TA on earlier. Great NFL better. He made this game five. Now we have you on. You're making the game about four and a half. So it's we see where the inflation is happening. And I think what you mentioned about potentially that that spot of Cincinnati just being overvalued is interesting. But you commented on the Cincinnati offense and those numbers for Burrow against the blitz and not. And that ease of schedule, I think too, makes those numbers a little bit more damning because the Bengals in terms of defensive opponent, they've got a pretty easy walk throughout the course of the season. Does that, when you're looking at it, that kind of makes those numbers look a little bit worse than they ultimately are a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And um, when you look at um, some of the bad games, I mean, against the Jaguars, they had that crazy fourth quarter comeback, but Huge. the offense couldn't really get anything going for almost three quarters. They didn't have a great game against the Jets, for instance. They had these two games against the Ravens that all, already were down some cornerbacks. And the Ravens are basically the perfect matchup for, for Joe Burrow because they like to leave their corners on islands. They like to blitz a lot. And we saw that in the first game. And Joe Burrow was able to light those guys on fire against the Chiefs three weeks ago. Exactly the same. Steve Spagnuolo calls a, a cover zero blitz on third and 27. And Bro just needed to chuck it up to Jamar Chase and, and he made a play. And yep. I just don't think that you can play that style of offense against the, the Las Vegas defense. They are trying to come with four and play sound coverage behind it. At least they are playing coverage and they will not try to leave so many guys on islands and um, let Joe Bro just chuck it up. So, um, yeah, um, I just think that the Bengals have played a great season. Joe Brewers have, have been playing a great season. But I think in, in his first um, playoff matchup against this Raiders defense that really fits the the matchup style that the Bengals have kind of struggled against, I think um, they are probably overvalued. Terrific insight there. You teased a little bit of the Buccaneers matchup advantages against the Eagles. Can I, can I pry for a little more insight there and sort of how you're looking at that one? And I don't, I don't think you've bet that yet, but just curious to get your thoughts there on a game that really hasn't moved that much yet, just after a little bit of money had opened. Yeah, so first of all, we have to monitor the weather quite a bit there. Um, I think right now it looks like it could be heavily raining that day. I, I've, uh, I saw, I think, 20 to 23 miles per hour of sustained winds one hour ago. So that's something to monitor, which would probably alter the style of offense that the Bucks would like to play, um, sling, slinging the ball downfield. Um, I think it's probably very hard to go against Tom Brady um, in the playoffs facing a second-year quarterback 
uh, rookie, rookie head coach. I think there's a path for success for the Eagles if they are able to run the ball. And their offensive line and that running, bay, uh, running game, especially with Jalen Hurts, has really been lights out over the course of the season, especially over the second half of the season. I will say that they have not faced many tough opponents and all basically all of their wins came against inferior opponents. So that's also something we have to adjust. But um, the Buccaneers, they have some injuries on their front seven. Lavonte David will likely be out. Jason Pierre-Paul is not having a great season. Um, over, over the second half of the season, the, the Bucks defense has not been playing very well against the run in terms of efficiency, um, despite playing teams like Washington, the Giants, uh, the Saints twice, who have a terrible run game this season. And their efficiency numbers are don't don't really match up what their personal looks like. Um, I think over the course of the season, their run defense in terms of DVA is 12. They were, I think, first last year. So there has been some decline along the front seven. They are also not getting so much to the pass, I would say. So I think that if the Eagles can run the ball well, efficiently, that's, that might be a path for success to keep this game close. But on the other side, Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, Mike Evans against the defense. I just sounds don't know. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. And I don't know how they're going to cover Rob Gronkowski. I mean, Alex Singleton in man coverage, That's that would be like a 150-yard game for, for Rob Gronkowski. So they would probably, they need to play some bracket coverage on him. Darius Slay might be matched up on uh, Mike Evans on the outside. But I just don't see how this Eagles defense they have made some adjustments over the second half of the season. They have, uh, they were switching up some things, been playing a little bit more aggressive. But overall, it's a pretty static defense that relies on zone coverage. Um, the Bucks have one of the best pass protecting offensive lines in the in the league. So I don't really see how the Eagles can get major advantage there. So I would ex I would still expect Tom Brady to slice that um, defense all day long, especially over the middle. But now it comes with the weather. Don't know what to expect there. I, I just saw one hour ago that there's going to be rain and wind, which would probably alter the um, game plan for both offenses. That total came crashing down too just before we went on air. It was right around 48-ish, and it's been I saw as low as 46. So I was talking about that at the top of the show is, is most likely weather, no matter the time of season, playoffs, regular season, anytime, it's going to move a number. Before I let you go, uh, just quickly, any thoughts, San Francisco, Dallas, a divisive game, but one I think a lot of people watching are curious about. Anything there from you on what you're seeing within that matchup? I think it could be a terrible matchup for Dallas. Um, I think oh. minus three is looking like a pretty good number right now. Um, if it goes to a three and a half, which could be the case, I would probably considering the 49ers. Um, but the Dallas Cowboys... Their defense has been very good, especially against the pass, but they have not really faced a lot of tough offenses. And this is basically the first time um, for the Dallas Cowboys this season that they face this type of offense. And I think this could eventually be a nightmare matchup for Dallas on defense because the Niners can run the ball on them, I would say, however they want. Trent Williams might be back this week, highest graded um, left tackle, I think, over the past decade by PFF. Um, and they really have the, the scheme with their fullback, with George Kittle, with Trent Williams, to kick out those great pass rushers in the run game. Um, then they have a lot more dynamic weapons in the passing game. Then Quinn is playing a very, very aggressive style of defense. And this is like the perfect matchup for Kyle Shannon to scheme up against. I mean, um, I'm talking, uh, I'm hyping up the San Francisco 49ers now. I mean, there's a reason why the number is still minus three because the Cowboys are the better team on paper. But I think the, the 49ers can be a dangerous team, not only this Sunday, but also over the course of the playoffs because they they are at the healthiest they have been all season. Their offense is prolific. Um, their um, pass coverage has some issues, but their front four can get home, very deep rotation. And as soon as their offense is clicking and Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't throw the ball underneath to linebackers, they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with everyone, I would say. Um, let's let's just imagine they win this week and they go to, to the Packers next, next week. The Packers cannot defend the run. 
So another great matchup for the 49ers. Um, very curious what that number would look like on the opener. Me too. But, and then if they win this, I'm just speaking hypothetically, hypothetically now, but if they win that, Tampa Bay, like I said, they are not the great elite run defense that they were last year. So I think the 49ers, from a value upside perspective, I think I saw it 27 to 1 at Matchbook today for the Super Bowl. Um, I think they are not the worst bet when you really when you're really looking for for value because the upside with them is tremendous in my opinion. The path, like when you just start looking and piecing teams together, and like you mentioned, there's the matchup this week, and then Green Bay next week, and then potentially what comes after. Like it just if they get ahead and get rolling this week, it just it happens to line up so well for them. And and this is a team that like professionals love them in the off season coming into the year, they were taking so much money and they've been betting being bet so consistently down the stretch too, that it's interesting to see. So Las Vegas for you, uh, very interesting angle. there. very good breakdown from you on all three of those games. Uh, and sneakily, I think people are going to watch this back and find some prop information that maybe you intentionally, or maybe not so much talked about with tight ends against opposing defenses and some of these breakdowns. So I think there was more to it there within the breakdown, but I really appreciate you sparing 15 minutes of your Wednesday evening here and uh, might have to bother you to get you back on next week. If that's all right. Of course. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Chat to you soon.